Welcome to our plenary session this afternoon. Uh, we've had an interesting morning so far with uh, some uh, partner presentations and then uh, our first round of concurrent sessions. Uh, we have uh, two important um, presentations today and the uh, um, one of the interesting things in this conference is that I had to juggle around the uh, components uh, of the uh, concurrent sessions because we received so many abstracts to fit everything in. We're having an abstract, uh, a, 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 a concurrent session this afternoon as well. So our first presenter today is of, of note. Uh, has been in uh, education as a teacher, as a college lecturer, as a lecturer and as a senior lecturer at university and was also the chief director of teaching, learning and research development in the South African Department of Higher Education and Training and now has a, uh, another prestigious appointment as Chief Executive of, uh, Officer of the Council of Higher Education, Dr. Whitfield Green, which we all refer to as Witty. So welcome, uh, Witty. And if you like, uh, we could wait a little bit, but I think we can start with your presentation. Thank, thank you very much, Alan. Thank you for the warm welcome uh, and good afternoon to all uh, attending the conference uh, today. Really a privilege to be part of this uh, and to be given an opportunity uh, to present uh, at the conference. I have a short presentation. Hopefully I can move through it quite quickly uh, and allow for a brief time for any engagement. Um, I'll just share my screen quickly. So I've been asked to just uh, give some uh, input uh, on new directions in quality assurance um, in the South African context uh, and a brief reflection on some of the implications uh, for institutions. So as, um, uh, as Alan has indicated, um, I am at the CHE at present uh, and really privileged to join the CHE at a time when there's quite a lot of change and innovation happening uh, in the quality assurance landscape. A new quality assurance framework was approved by a council uh, in September, 2020, and the CHE is working to implement uh, this framework with the target date for implementation being uh, the academic year 2024. So we are really putting in place a whole range of uh, initiatives that prepare the ground for the implementation. We wanted to do it in this way so that we actually prepare both the CAG and the sector for what we see uh, as a massive change uh, going forward. Um, and colleagues, it really is a paradigm shift uh, in relation to how we think about and how we then do a quality assurance uh, in the country, uh, in higher education. The CHE is seeking to position itself differently uh, within the sector and to uh, enhance the role of, of institutions uh, in relation to quality assurance. So the really big objective of the new quality assurance framework is to devolve the responsibility uh, for quality assurance uh, to institutions uh, predominantly. Um, there is a significant imbalance at present. Uh, where uh, quality assurance is perceived uh, to be, and is visibly so, a compliance uh, uh, process uh, in the South African higher education system with very little ownership uh, at institutional level. Uh, and we're really seeking to change uh, uh, that uh, 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 situation. So we'll see over the next few years as we start to introduce the QAF, a big shift from the CHE being predominantly accountable for quality assurance to shared accountability for quality assurance and the CHE also enhancing its development and support and capacity building role in the sector. We want to move from prescription um, to uh, generative, uh, reflective, uh, reflexive methodologies and drawing on institutional input, colleagues input in defining pathways and processes uh, for quality assurance. Uh, we want to retain independence and objectivity as the CHE, but to supplement and complement that with a, a strong emphasis 
on building partnerships and collaboration. Um, the QAF is, as, as I said, about devolving uh, uh, responsibility for quality assurance to be shared between the CHE and institutions. And so we want to move away from just this predominant focus on external quality assurance to building internal quality assurance capacity at institutions. And increasingly going forward, the CHE will seek to work in this collaborative, constructive partnership modality with the system, but in a way that is not a one size fits all. So the uniform approach that's being implemented up to now will start to shift to a much more differentiated engagement uh, with institutions. So for institutions where there is strong evidence of internal quality assurance capacity, uh, evidence based on data, um, it will be possible going forward for the CHE to interact differently with it, those institutions, with other institutions where there might be a need to build capacity a different kind uh, of engagement would be possible. So you will see that we'll engage institutions differently over accreditation, we'll engage institutions differently over reviews. Uh, and the word reviews is one that comes into the vocabulary in replacement to the idea of audits. Um, so this idea of a reflexive reflexivity and generative method methodolo methodologies uh, align to this idea that we'll undertake reviews in the system rather than audits. So moving away from the policing and the accounting to a, 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 a place where we kind of get institutions to be deeply reflective about processes, policies, systems, structures, the re their relationship to quality, uh, and, and, and how we kind of make those links. So the CHE will increasingly want to be working in third spaces, not an either or, uh, not this kind of very um, a mechanistic holding to accountable uh, 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 role to one that's much more fluid, flexible, uh, and collaborative uh, in the system. Uh, and we we'll, uh, uh, want to work much more strongly with institutions in this regard. So the new QAF essentially puts forward the idea that there will be two ways in which we engage institutions, in accreditation and in quality reviews. And the idea is that we start to think about the entire value chain of uh, quality assurance much more equitably, where currently the focus has been very much on the input side. You know, what are you putting into the design of your programs? What are your plans for resourcing? What are your plans for teaching learning ratios? What are your plans for pedagogies? We're wanting to now understand quality assurance along the full continuum. Input, outcomes, right up to impact. And so these two main mechanisms of accreditation and quality reviews will enable us to do this. Quality reviews being a toolbox of reviews that will include institutional reviews, reviews at the qualification or program level nationally, themed reviews. So for example, we could have a review of online and blended learning uh, and so on. Um, we're looking to be much more uh, 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 driven by a focus on standards. Uh, and these standards being a collectively agreed codes of practice that the sector sets up for itself in relation to key higher education areas of operation in terms of how they implement it and then in terms of how they are evaluated. So standards development become a really important underpinning function uh, and then associated with that a capacity development. We're introducing a new form of standards uh, into the system. So we currently have qualification standards that colleagues will uh, know about and probably have party to uh, their development. Um, uh, we'll now be developing what we're calling higher education practice standards uh, as a way of creating a more coherent approach uh, to quality assurance uh, in the country. Um, over the next few years, as we introduce the QAF, we've chosen areas of focus themes uh, along which we'll uh, undertake our engagement and quality assurance. And the two key themes um, that we'll focus on over the next few years is learning and teaching uh, and transformation. And then again, you can see the complete links 
to uh, the Siapumalela work in terms of the Siapumalela focus uh, on these areas as well. Uh, we also think that uh, the QAF has to be supported through the uh, activation of structure. Uh, and so uh, implementing integrating structures uh, uh, to support the QAF. Uh, communities of practice will be a strong feature of the work. So strengthening the CHE's focus on the use of peers to undertake the CHE's uh, engagement with the sector much more uh, and activating communities of practice across a whole range of areas, including in this area of standard development. We'll be embarking on a much more information-driven approach, evidence-based approach. And so the development of a quality assurance framework management information system that underpins quality assurance processes and allows us to collect, record, uh, and view data over time uh, in relation to quality assurance. And then we're also thinking that organizationally, we are going to be have to be changing both as the CHE uh, and as institutions in order to take on this much more integrated approach to quality, putting quality at the forefront uh, of our work going forward. So colleagues, I want to just hone in, uh, and I'm being selective in this presentation because of the shortage of time. We certainly will be engaging in much more detail and have already started doing so with the sector, with individual institutions on the QAF. I'd like to just hone in on this notion of standards uh, as a really important feature of the QAF going forward. Um, and we have a working group in place drawn from the sector, uh, uh, and there may be people in this meeting who are participating in that working group. Uh, this working group has come up with this frame for the development of uh, what we're calling higher education practice standards that we'll be developing standards in four areas, um, very interlinked areas. Uh, and these four kind of focus areas uh, uh, collectively represent higher education practice. So the four areas are facilitating knowledges, uh, the area of learning environments and experiences, the area of facilitating transitions, uh, and the area of generating and using data. At the core of quality assurance, um, is learning, teaching, and assessment uh, with the focus on people, right? Uh, and then associated to learning, teaching, and assessment are the other core mandates of community engagement uh, and research and innovation. But certainly for the first few years uh, of this uh, QAF, the focus on learning, teaching, and assessment are driven through people. And then integrating themes, uh, connecting these focus areas, uh, the need for higher education to build a sustainable and equitable society, the need for higher education institutions to be sites of change. Um, and you can see the transformation narrative starting to be embedded quite strongly there, uh, and a focus on leadership and management as well as a key enabling factor uh, in uh, the ownership of quality assurance going forward. Um, these are the areas of standards, uh, the areas of higher education practice that uh, are pre preliminary uh, 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 areas that have been identified. Not yet set in stone, still very much open to discussion, uh, debate, and critique. Uh, and the communities of practice will be how we take these forward and how we eventually settle on which one of them, them which of them we actually do take forward. So you can see they are color coded with these colors uh, representing those four focus areas uh, up front. Um, uh, ranging from the first focus area, the second one, the third one, uh, and the fourth one. And then colleagues, if we're looking at this through a Siapumalela lens, you can then again see how the Siapumalela work will contribute uh, uh, to building capacity around these standards uh, and then enabling the institution uh, and the sector uh, to meet uh, these standards. The standards, codes of practice, will be uh, uh, complemented by guidelines uh, in terms of how we build towards them uh, and then criteria in terms of how we evaluate whether they've been achieved or not. A really uh, another important uh, feature of the QAF and also uh, pertinent to the discussion and input today is this idea that quality assurance will start to uh, 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 take on the affordances offered by technology. And so this idea of building a quality assurance framework management information system that allows us 
to implement the external quality assurance functions of accreditation and quality reviews in a much more digitized way. We think this is gonna increase uh, efficiencies enormously, uh, but also effectiveness. The idea is that we'll manage the processes through these systems, but these systems will also generate a lot of data uh, and information. There will be decision-making coming through these systems that can then feed into what we're calling institutional quality dashboards that sit at the heart of the system. Uh, and it, the, the vision is that we'll have an institutional quality dashboard or a set of dashboards for every institution. And every time there's an engagement around quality, there'll be an engagement through accreditation or through quality reviews. There'll be decisions on quality made through those engagements. Those decisions will be in relation to these higher education areas of practice um, and will be recorded in institutional dashboards. So over time, what we'll start to see is a track record of quality being built up at the institutional level. And then if we aggregate at the institutional level, what we'll start to see is what does the quality of higher education as a higher education sector uh, look like? We'll be able to see institutions that are consistent uh, in relation to quality, in relation to the uh, engagements, and we'll be able to see institutions where development and support is needed. And this is gonna enable us to engage differently with institutions. So what you'll be able to see through this uh, mechanism is changing quality assurance status over time. Uh, and we're looking at these four levels of quality assurance from not functional to highly functional. Uh, and this is related then to the standards uh, and decisions made in relation to those standards. But the idea is that this will give us a lens through which we can make decisions about how institutions uh, 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 afforded uh, 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 semi-autonomy in relation to quality assurance. So for example, if an institution over time starts to build a track record of highly functional or functional, the CHE's position is that those institutions shouldn't be reviewed in three-year three periods. We would review and then say in seven years time, another review could happen. You know? Whereas for an institution where obviously there's capacity challenges uh, and needs for development, reviews could be more consistent, but associated with those reviews could also be strong capacity development uh, interventions through CHE initiatives, but collectively through the system, through Siapumalela initiatives, through UCDP initiatives, and so on. We also think that this will allow us to treat institutions differently in terms of accreditation. So for example, if an institution is consistently demonstrating strong internal quality assurance, the idea is that for those institutions, we would devolve the responsibility for program approval to institutional level and just worry about qualification accreditation uh, at the CHE. So for example, if WITS was an institution that was deemed to be functional, the idea is that WITS would then be deemed to have program approval status. If WITS has a BCOM in place and WITS wanted to introduce a BCOM in data management, WITS would not need to come through a CHE process for that. Its internal processes have been shown to be robust and rigorous um, and Senate and council can take responsibility for that approval. Uh, and CHE would endorse that approval or not when it uh, visits the institution and engages through quality reviews. So you can see a, quite a significant devolution of responsibility to institutions going forward. What this does do is it requests institutions to start ta ta taking seriously and to take ownership for quality and to gain autonomy uh, in relation to quality uh, going forward. So, so putting the ball in institutions courts uh, around us and moving away from this issue of now the CHE 
is implementing a round of institutional audits, we suddenly see a lot of activity around quality in the system. You now policies get dusted off, structures start to get activated, uh, and a best foot forward starts to be presented. Uh, and then as soon as the audit is complete, there's a kind of defaulting to a, a normality where the rigor around quality tends to get lost. So the idea of the QAF is consistency uh, in relation to quality and the emphasis and the focus on quality. So uh, in closing then, uh, colleagues, some of the implications going forward uh, of uh, the new quality assurance uh, framework is that uh, it's going to be a requirement that institutions embed a focus on quality at all levels. That quality is not the responsibility of the CHE and it's not the responsibility of quality assurance units within the institution. It's the responsibility of the entire institution from the academics at the coal face of learning and teaching right up to the vice chancellor leading the organization. The idea is that uh, our, our focus on quality is a broad understanding of quality. Um, uh, and if we hone in on the notion of Sia Pumalele's focus on student success and, and enhancing student success, then certainly quality around student success has to be much more than throughputs and has to be inclusive of the achievement of graduate attributes, a successful transitions into the workplaces and contributions to society. So you can see this idea of movement from inputs to outcomes, outputs, uh, and impact. Uh, and if we interpret that in relation to student success, an idea of quality around student success becomes much bigger than just a focus on the pass rates. And, and so how does Sia Pumalela factor this uh, into its work? And how does colleagues uh, in, in the Sia Pumalela ne network uh, start to think in this direction? There's gonna be an increasing emphasis on providing evidence of quality, rigor, and robustness of internal quality assurance systems and processes, both qualitative and qualitative and quantitative. So you can see the need for institutional capacity around research, data, information gathering, analysis, collection, and representation in order to show evidence of quality at all levels of the system. Uh, and then finally, uh, um, the idea that we start to use these standards as core elements for engaging quality in the system. So that once we have the standards in place, they become the North Stars around which we drive capacity building, drive quality in terms of those processes, and we evaluate quality. And you can see the selection of standards is starting to point very closely to the focus areas for uh, uh, Sia Pumalela. The idea of a focus on data management, data generation, data analysis, data utilization, uh, and the idea of a focus on student transitions into higher education, through higher education, and from higher education. So thank you colleagues for the opportunity. Hopefully this starts to give you a sense of where we're going uh, with the quality assurance framework and what some of uh, the implications are for our reimagining and our rethinking uh, around process going forward. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Viti. This was a very interesting uh, presentation and it is interesting to see how um, the CHE is transforming away from just tick boxes to trying to improve the whole system and giving the institutions the power to um, manage their systems uh, together with other members of the, the higher education. So thank you very much for introducing Sia Pumalela and I'm sure many of the staff already know about this, what is happening, but it's nice to hear how we might be a part of this. I have uh, some questions uh, questions. Um, let me just go back a bit here. So uh, Carlene asks, 
I'm curious to know what outputs the quality dashboards will provide that allow insights into how and what works or doesn't work. How will you gain intelligence from monitoring to assure quality, not just report on functionality thereof? So I think a really important question and these quality dashboards will be built up over time. Um, so what I've presented to you was what we're seeing as the minimum viable product uh, to start off the work. But certainly going forward, we, we hope to draw in a whole range of data that will allow representation on the dashboards. Important to note the representation will be against those higher education practice standards. And so if we're doing a good job of quality assurance and gaining information that is really uh, 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 reliable uh, in relation to those higher education practice standards, then what, they, what the quality dashboards are giving us insight to is the extent to which quality is being achieved uh, in relation to those very diverse range of higher education practices. So we will start to see a, a much more nuanced view of quality uh, in the institution against these agreed upon standards. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, another one uh, is asking, uh, shouldn't the higher education uh, uh, not always have uh, been accountable and responsible for quality? I had a look at that question as it came up and I thought exactly, no? Uh, we shouldn't actually be asking this question uh, at this point. But sadly, sadly, uh, we need to, because we do see practice in the system that uh, treats the quality imperative, as you indicated, a uh, tick box exercise um, uh, 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 and accountability uh, exercise. Um, and an exercise that uh, only engages uh, bureaucrats and administrators uh, in institutions. Um, uh, and so the idea of institutional responsibility and devolved institutional responsibility is certainly what we're trying to drive uh, through the QAM. Uh, a question from uh, Samuel wants to know about the responsibility of professional bodies, for instance, the HBCSA uh, in the uh, QAF. Yeah, so, so we've been having these discussions with the professional bodies, um, and it's an area that is both a, a contested area um, uh, and in some ways a collaborative area. Uh, and we are hoping through the QAF that we'll find the space for collaboration and a meeting of minds. The idea is if the CHE starts to move its gaze to the qualification level increasingly, then there's quite a bit of space for the professional bodies to intensify their gaze at the program level uh, and for us to complement each other in terms of the information uh, coming out. So much more synergy and collaboration and working together with the professional bodies rather than the duplication that we're seeing at present. Uh, Gino has put a rather large uh, amount of words in the question. Gino, would you like to ask the question? Wow, Alan, thanks. Um, literally, all I want to know is um, what are the professional bodies out there, um, and, and not like the amalgamation bodies, but like what what's going to be on ground level there that's going to help take graduates from the university and make them employees of, of this value that you're speaking about? Th thanks, Gino. So, so, so one of the ways in which the sector has to be engaged uh, in higher education is uh, in a contribution to uh, thinking about curriculum and thinking about programs. So, so the CHE's approach to this is the development of qualification standards, engaging the, uh, engaging the workplace, engaging industry, engaging the professional bodies, engaging uh, the higher education sector to understand what a qualification needs to look like at the very high level uh, in order that we start to uh, get graduates that come out that start to transition more easily into the workplace. So that's one level of involvement. Another level of involvement that has to become much more stronger is in the work integrated learning component of programs that lead directly to the workplace. 
So how do we engage industry and the workplace much more strongly in that? And you'll see one of the focus areas for the standards is work integrated learning, uh, uh, building practice uh, around work integrated learning. And then another issue we're gonna have to pick up much more strongly uh, is this issue of transitions out of higher education. To be much more definite about tracking graduates as they exit our higher education spaces into workplaces and understanding the ease of those transitions or not so that that kind of research and information can feed back into, into programs. So certainly it's a collective exercise of uh, ensuring that we enable students to transition more effectively into workplaces. Collective in regard to professional body involvement, higher education involvement, uh, industry involvement, uh, and so on. Uh, we always want to emphasize though that higher education needs to play a role in getting graduates into the economy, but it's not the only role of higher education, that the higher education mission is much bigger than just the employment mission. Thank you, Doctor. Green, uh, I would like to ask you, there are some questions in the chat that you might uh, answer in the chat, because I would like to uh, thank you very much for your time and informing us. It was most uh, enlightening and I'm sure we are going to have lots of conversations with you in the future. So thank you very much. And so let's move on to the next uh, um, keynote. Thank, thank you. you very much, Ellen, and thank you colleagues for the opportunity. Thank you. We now have a, a very interesting uh, uh, presentation from our colleagues in uh, the University of the Free State. So, um, uh, Cornelia Janssen, Hanfira, Anneri Miller, and Francois Stradium are going to talk to us about how they have used the Carnegie Maths Pathways so that they can have a collaborative togetherness to develop quantitative business skills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you very much, colleagues. Alan, am I audible? You could just put a thumbs up. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, colleagues, thank you so much uh, uh, for us, uh, for giving us this opportunity. We're very grateful to Sadie and Siabu Malela for allowing us to, to talk to all of you. Um, so the title is a, a mouthful, Collaborative Togetherness to Develop Quantitative Business Skills uh, while implementing or through implementing the Carnegie Maths Pathway at a South African university and no, no prizes for guessing which university that is. Um, I think my introductory comments uh, will be brief and then I'll give over to, to uh, uh, Corleon Anneri. But uh, to give a little bit of background, uh, for five years, uh, maybe a little bit longer, um, the University of the Free State has been looking for ways to implement uh, a contextualized version uh, of the Carnegie Maths Pathways program uh, for the first time uh, on the continent. And therefore, we're incredibly grateful that we are here with you today uh, to share, um, I think, which is uh, for us uh, has been an amazing journey uh, with uh, uh, some significant impacts that we are itching to share with you in this presentation. Next slide, please, Andre. Right. <coughs> I think before I, I hand over to my two colleagues, I think it's, as you would have seen from our title, very important that I introduce the team. And uh, we want to emphasize through this slide, the fact that this is a collaborative co-creation experience between the students, our learning facilitators, which are uh, pictured here, as well as our uh, Carnegie Pathways colleagues uh, in the US. Um, and then very importantly, this project wouldn't have been possible without the visionary leadership of the Kresge Foundation in terms of creating 
this platform where we were introduced to new and different ways of thinking about quantitative and business skills. Throughout this presentation, uh, you will hear the voices uh, of the students. And with those couple of words, I hand over to Corleon Anari. Over to you. Thank you very much, um, Francois. So we thought of starting this presentation with sharing some background on the Carnegie Math Pathways program itself, just to allow the audience to, to come into our context. So the program is underpinned by several principles or drivers, as it's called by Carnegie. And these include, amongst others, language and literacy, students develop skills and maintain positive um, mindsets. And I just want you for one minute to stand still and think about the significance of this driver within a quantitative skills development module or a mathematics module. Students also see material as interesting and relevant. And then most important, um, especially with the presentation also today, the program promotes students' ties to their peers, coming back to the title of collaboration and togetherness. The program consists of two modules, namely Quantway, um, which is necessary for developing critical thinking and quantitative literacy, and Statway, focusing on statistical reasoning needed for decision making, especially under conditions of uncertainty. So I'm sure all of you would now ask the question, so why then this specific program for the University of the Free State? So in 2015-2016, the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the UFS identified some important factors relating to student success from analysis of student data. These included the significant influence of high school maths performance on overall academic success um, in MS students, and also the influence of high school maths on the performance of MS students in first year economics modules, which in turn also had an influence on their overall academic performance. The faculty was also faced with persistent poor graduation rates, uh, even below the national average. The faculty then realized that the traditional mathematical approach to quantitative skills development did not yield the intended results needed to change the student success indicators as mentioned above. Evidence from literature showed the success of the Carnegie Math Pathways program within this area of quantitative literacy. And it seemed a viable possibility within our context to achieve student success. So we started working together um, with WestEd. And in 2021, amidst COVID, we launched an online offering of the Carnegie Math Pathways program for all registered first year students in the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences. It is also important to mention that throughout the planning phase, as well as the implementation, and then still continuing now, we focus on contextualization of the learning material and adaptation of the implementation specifically for the South African context. So if we look at the program, a typical lesson in the Carnegie Math program would consist of firstly a preparation activity, which is done by students individually introducing the context of that specific lesson and including exercises which they then complete and bring to the collaboration session. The collaboration session is a small group um, based um, session where students work together to solve, solve some of the problems to gain a deeper understanding of the content. 
And then after the collaboration, there's another out of class individual exercise to really embed the knowledge and understanding of the content. And which also gives the students the opportunity to test their knowledge or their understanding of the content of that specific lesson before moving on to the next lesson. So because of um, the time limit, we are only focusing on the collaboration session um, today, as it really also links with the theme of the conference, namely the role of students in student success. Before I hand over to Anari to share some of our results with you, we would like to show you a short video clip of such a collaboration session. Be on the lookout for the drivers mentioned before. For example, how students see the material as interesting, how they engage with language and literacy, and how students rely on each other to arrive at a collective answer in a safe environment. Thank you. It is actually based on the amount of money you make per year. Income tax is broken into levels called tax brackets. The table below shows the tax bracket for South Africa 2019 to 2020. Oh, South Africa, you know, challenge. Write a single expression that you can use to calculate the income tax for a person earning 234,300. 234,300 is here, 26%. How much does it does she earn? 263,300. 263,300 times 26%. How much is that one? It's 3,050. That's what I got. How did you get it? Are you guys going to do the exercise when you're done here? Brother, me, I got 68,718. How? Write a single expression, expression that you can use to calculate the income tax for a person earning. Oh, we are not completing yet. I thought, what, what do they mean when this is single expression? Like a equation. No, there's a difference between equation and expression. It's not the same thing. Okay, what is an expression? Expression and not equals to. It's in words. And equals to. It's in words. Yeah, but maybe a bit crazy. Well, from the exercise, yeah, there's collaboration. They do things like this. Three, five, two, five, three. Where did you get that one, my friend? Oh, plus the 26%. Nice. Okay, my Mela and Henny. Okay, but ready. Um, text rate is 35,253. Plus the twenty six percent of which the amount exceeds one hundred and ninety five eight fifty. So they want the difference between the taxable income and the one ninety five eight fifty, which is the amount that it exceeds it with. Oh, I get it. The one the taxable income <laughs> is actually based on the amount of. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so with that, uh, uh, you just saw how our students were a brief video clip of how our students collaborated in, in, in one of our sessions. But I just want to introduce myself. My name is Anari Miller. I'm the teaching and learning manager for the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences here at UFS. And my role in the project is um, I'm, I'm the coordinator for the two modules, uh, you know, with us, it's now Quantway and Statway, and, and then for the implementation project. And it's my privilege today to share some of our initial findings with you. So you heard now what the intention is for, for the collaborations. Um, and you saw a little a clip of, of how our students collaborated. Um, I think now the big question is what, what do the students think? So um, we would like to share with you some of the qualitative feedback that we received from our students. Um, this is after the first semester of the Quantway. So our students did Quantway Core in semester one. 
um, and they did Statway College in, in semester two. So after semester one, we received some feedback from our students. I think that really shows um, that they valued the experience of the, the collaborations, that they learned from each other. You, you can see there, um, it's, it's a safe environment to, to express and communicate that they, uh, uh, you know, in some of the other clips or feedback that we received also, some students indicated that they learned to communicate it. They delivered, that they developed some leadership skills, you know, apart from just the quantitative reasoning skills. I mean, you saw them a little bit of debate there around what is the expression and the formula. Um, and, you know, if I, if I just look at that one, uh, the group collaboration for me was extremely useful, getting different points of view from different individuals and learning how there is more than one way to answer a question. These are the type of things that our students value. Um, and I think for us, this was particularly significant in 2021 with the introduction. You know, in the first semester, we were still in an online, a new, unfamiliar online environment using the Carnegie Math Pathways program or platform. Um, and in an ERT environment. And traditionally for our faculty, when we receive feedback, from our students um, regarding group work, it's not always so enjoyable for them. So, so this was significant for us uh, after that first initial exposure to the collaborations and to the Carnegie Math Pathways program. Sorry, let's just get there. So the students enjoyed the collaborations, uh, but did it impact their academic performance? So what we have here, we would just like to share some metrics here around the collaboration specifically. We've got uh, students completing collaborations. There were 39 in total in Quad by there. Um, the attendance of collaborations, so just uh, attending and pitching up for class. And then we've got the marks for the collaboration. So actually getting the different calculations correct. Um, and we've correlated that with a final mark at the end of the semester. Um, and I think it's noteworthy to see that attendance of collaboration had a statistically significant uh, relationship with a final mark, but to a much greater extent, you know, 0 0.72, than the actual marks that they got for the collaboration. So we saw that students pitching up for class uh, working with these uh, fellows, uh, the subgroups, you know, classes of, or, or, or we had groups of three to five students debating and this productive struggle that they have with the content, just pitching up had a much greater uh, relationship with their final mark than the actual marks for the collaborations. So the collaborations do have an impact on their final mark. But what was the final marks for these students? Um, so we would like to share some other numbers with you as well. I'm going to show the, the academic performance in both Quantway and Statway for our students, uh, a short international comparison, and then academic performance and overall performance, influence on overall performance. So this is the overall performance in Quantway, the semester one module. The red bar there represents Quantway, the 2021 implementation of this of this course. The blue bar represents the 2020 version of the math-based course that, that our students had. So um, in terms of final marks, there was an increase there of 3% for our students. In terms of success rate, not really a change. It stayed exactly the same. But what we do see there is that the proportion of our students that passed with distinction increased significantly, which indicates a much deeper understanding of the concepts. But 5% of this with, with this distinctions is quite high. But um, I would like to point out at this stage that the, the mathematical concepts that we use to promote the quantitative reasoning are familiar to our students. Uh, students studying a BCom program come in with the NSC math requirements. So they did have some math exposure previously. When it comes to Statway, the second semester, um, Statway is now a fully blown statistics course. 
And before I talk about the, the results there in the performance, um, I think it's important to point out that our students, although in semester one, they had some exposure to math previously, that is not the case when it comes to statistics for the majority, if not all of our students. Um, many of, this, of our students never worked with statistics before. Some of them do have um, in, in mathematics in high school, maybe a, a brief introduction, introduction to basic probabilities. Um, but most of the context uh, and content, sorry, was, was unfamiliar to our students. And in the qualitative feedback that we received from our students, there was a clear indication in terms of the contrast in terms of the level of difficulty for them in Statway because it was so, so unfamiliar. Um, so the question is, how did they do? Now with this uh, collaborations and the students working together, we saw that the students Statway now, again, the red bar from 2020 to 2021, again, there was an increase in the far average final mark of our students the success rate increased with 6% in this when compared to the previous statistics based course that we had. Don't know why I said statistics. Um, and then again, you know, uh, the, the proportion of our students that passed with distinction increased, increased substantially. In terms of international comparison, you know, we would like to, to know how do we fare with the pathways networks, the network. So the US based institutions that also implement, uh, implemented the Carnegie Math Pathways program. So the top table there in, indicates the, the, the differences in success rates in Quantway Core and Statway College. Uh, UFS compared to the network. And if you look at that, it looks like the UFS students uh, outperformed the, the US uh, uh, institutions um, at a glance. But I think it's very important again here to, to indicate that our students at UFS do come in with the NSC math requirement, which is not necessarily the case uh, for the US-based institutions for, for their programs. So we're not completely comparing apples with apples here. Um, but I think what is evident is the, the substantial success uh, uh, that, that Pathways has in the US. I think um, we, we do see that in the UFS context, we are sharing in that benefits. Then um, at the bottom there is the results for some productive persistence metrics. Um, so so just, just an indication um, or explanation of what that is. Uh, productive persistence, there are various metrics, you know, like growth mindset. A uh, growth mindset is, you know, uh, am I able to learn new things? Am I capable to do mathematics? You know, um, am I capable to learn new things? Stereotype threat, you know, that's the, the typical stereotypes around mathematics or quantitative uh, uh, modules, if you would. The stereotype that you need to be uh, from a certain school or you need to have a certain characteristic to be successful in math or quantitative uh, uh, modules. Math anxiety, I think that's something we can all also relate to. That moment before you walk into a math test, uh, where you feel, listen, did I, it doesn't matter how much I studied, I don't know whether I can do this. Uh, that is what math anxiety, uh, what those three metrics measure, if you would. So we, we, we gathered the information through a productive persistence survey from Pathways, which we administered various times across the year, um, last year. And the values that you see there is a value out of five. So the, the, the closer the value gets to five, the better. So if there's an improvement uh, closer to five, that means there's a, a positive improvement in that metric. Now, if we look at growth mindset, our students came in with a growth mindset level at 3.21, which towards the end of the year after Statway increased to 4.29, uh, yeah, 4.29. So showing that our students uh, there was a positive influence on our students' own view and perceptions of their abilities, of their capabilities. 
stereotype threat with Quantway uh, from week one to the end of term, EOT there is end of term to the end of Quantway. We did also see a, a, a positive increase there. So that is a decrease in stereotype threat. The same with math anxiety. Although towards the end of Statway, stereotype threat and math anxiety did see a, a slight decrease from where, where it was at the Quantway level. And I think that can be attributed to, to, to the fact that the students experience Statway as being more, more challenging in terms of content than Quantway. Um, but overall, uh, we, we, we find the positive trends in terms of the productive persistence metrics really encouraging. Um, all right, so then we would like also to share the impact of pathways and the performance in our pathway courses, this is statway specifically that I'm going to talk to now in a, in a second, on students' overall success, you know, does performance in statway and quantway influence our students' overall academic success and to what extent? Um, remember, at the, at, at the end of the day and, and the whole reason for initiating this project is to get our students to graduate and graduate minimum time or faster to improve graduation rates. Um, so similar to what Tim Reddick mentioned yesterday from Georgia State in his plenary, we identified a predictor module, if you would, a course economics 101 that was found to be statistically significant in its correlation with students' graduation. So as a very early indicator, we looked to see what the impact could be on performance in Statway, on the performance on economics. And that's what you see here. Statway, performance of Statway, uh, the impact on the performance of, on, on economics on, on the right, the, the 2021 table there, compared to the previous year. Um, so what we do see here, is yes, it has a statistically significant positive impact, which is fantastic. But if we look at the R square value, the R square value gives us an idea to what extent does uh, uh, performance in stat way explain the variation of the performance in economics. And if you compare 2020 with 2021, that has increased substantially. Then we also created an academic average variable, which is basically a, a final mark average of all other modules that the students were enrolled for, um, other than Statway. And we did exactly the same thing, ran a bivariate uh, a regression uh, for 2020 as a baseline and 2021 to compare with. And once again, we saw that there was an increase in in, in the R square value, so increase in, in the extent to which it can explain the changes in performance, which is an, in essence, an increase in the predictability of students overall academic performance. So after Statway, after the end of semester two, we also got some qualitative feedback uh, uh, from our students, just showing it there for you on the board. Uh, or slide, um, and I think it really shows and demonstrates the value of the collaborations and the students working together, especially in semester two, that, that increase in the value as the, the content became more, more challenging to the students. I think all in all, uh, through the results, uh, we, we can say that, yes, the aim and the approach of Carnegie Math path Pathways resonated with us and our goals from the beginning. That's why we implemented it as well. But I think from our first round of results, we can, or let me not say we, let me say I, I will speak for myself, but I think we can say uh, that it also resonates with our context and with, with our students. But I think no one can, can share that better than one of our students. So I'm going to play a short voice note um, they will say it better than me before I hand over to Francois again for concluding our presentation. Thank you. Wow, in grade 12, I got really low marks in math. Um, well, myth was 
Uh, it was difficult. It was difficult for me. It was difficult. It didn't matter how many times I tried it out and how many times I asked questions. I can do it. it. Now it does not matter how hard I probably might think it is, but with practice and with practice and with practice over and over again, I can get it. So basically this module has helped me find that um, even though I used to get really low marks in, in the past and now I'm getting really high marks, like I can do it, you know? It's changed my view of math. It's fun as well. It's made math fun for me. Um, because I used to dread math a lot. Like every time when there was um a math a math um subject or module period, I really used to just hope that, oh my goodness, why did I come to class or why did I come to school knowing very well that I'm gonna have a math period? But now I don't care. I I I I don't get that much anxiety when it comes to math. The only anxiety I get when it comes to math now is I've been excelling all this time. Will I be able to excel with this upcoming test? And it's not me thinking, oh, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail. No, now my anxiety is more on the positive side. And that is what this month module has done for me. I am more confident when it comes to numbers now. And thank you. Um. All right, so colleagues, we've given you some numbers. Uh, we've uh, talked to you about or shared the voice of the students. So to share a little bit more about our plans and how we see things moving forward. Um, you know, in terms of our pedagogy and our curriculum work, uh, we are continuously evaluating um, the work that we do. One of the benefits of working with the Carnegie team, and if you wonder why Anari or Kolia used West Ed, Carnegie became part of West Ed so that it's clear to you that it's not confusing. But one of the benefits of working with a Carnegie team is that you continuously get information on how your students are doing. Uh, and I'm gonna say that again, how your students are doing, our students in our context. And that then informs our pedagogical changes uh, continuously. Uh, we're extremely grateful again, uh, uh, um, the Kresge Foundation's Visionary Insights uh, have supported even deeper contextualization um, of the materials. Um, we're now bringing in uh, decolonial perspectives as well, uh, uh, multidisciplinary perspectives, and uh, it's going to be a cross con a con continental team because looking critically at knowledge, where knowledge comes from, who are the contributors to knowledge is uh, important to uh, us and our US uh, colleagues. Um, in terms of sharing the results, this is the first presentation we have. We've just received news yesterday that one of our abstracts for a paper in the South African Journal has been accepted. We are open to any uh, conversations that colleagues would like to have uh, regarding new ways, uh, new ways of using pedagogy in mathematics. And then we also have a workshop coming out linked to our learning and teaching conference at the university on the 12th of September, um, where we will involve our colleagues from the US and we can give you a deep dive into the many, many aspects um, that make up um, the math, the Carnegie Maths Pathway initiative. And we'll have even more results and more perspectives from our facilitators. So to just share a concluding thought, you might ask, well, 
Um, why the title? And then you can change the slide. Thank you. All right. So in reflecting on what this project has, has meant uh, uh, for us um, and why this title is so important to us, uh, if we look at what we were able to, to overcome, remember now, this was launched in, uh, I can't remember the lockdown level, I think we've all repressed them, but uh, in 2021, for South Africans, the pandemic was still a very scary thing. Um, uh, we implemented it on South African networks, fully online, right? Uh, with our students and they performed like you saw from the data and from their voices, right? We, or for us, the question becomes, um, are we building for Ubuntu here or have we simply created an environment that unlocks the uh, phenomenal cultural potential or cultural capital that our students come with to all our academic disciplines. And if we confront our pedagogy, how we approach the teaching and learning of our disciplines, our students not only uh, achieve what's asked of them, but they exceed it because we created something that's deeply embedded in where we are. So, through our collaborative togetherness as students, as learning facilitators, as uh, curriculum developers, I'd like to think that we've become uh, better people out of this experience. And uh, it's an experience um, that we hope uh, we can share with as many colleagues as we possibly can um, in South Africa. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity, Jenny and Alan. We really appreciate it. And uh, we'll end there. Thank you, Francois and the team. This has been an interesting um, discussion because we have been saying for a long time that we need to think about the best way for our students to engage in mathematics and you raised the, the issue of Ubuntu, which is nothing more than the, 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 the collaboration model that they use. And so it, it, it should be a natural um, alignment between them. There are some questions. Um, Mbongeni says, uh, considering that the average and success rate did not change significantly, do you consider other factors that may have contributed to the improved uh, distinction rate? Could I pass that on to Anri for the first step and then uh, we'll uh, take it from there, Alan? Sure. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, yes, you are right. With Quantway in semester one, the success rate in terms of the number of students that passed the course did not change compared to the to the previous year. However, the average final mark of the student did did increase. So um, we we did see that students have have a deeper understanding. Um, if, if you would, of the, the same context or, or mathematical concepts that, that we shared with the students. Um, and, you know, in terms of the, the, the um, correlations uh, with, with our final marks, yes, there are other factors, you know, that, that absolutely plays a role in terms of their final marks. Um, we've only shared uh, one, one aspect here today, which is the collaboration. But, uh, you know, and I would, I would love to share you, with you all, all the details, perhaps, if, if you would want to, to drop me a mail. But I can share that uh, the participation in the collaborations out of all the factors that we have metrics for did have the greatest influence on the students' final marks. Thank you. Um, uh, Jenny would like 
uh, to say that collaboration with each other was clearly very important. Could you also talk about the types of problems discussed in the collaborative sessions? Yes, so um, in these collaborations, so this was basically our, our contact sessions, our lecture time with our students. They, we had four, four scheduled collab collaboration periods a week. Um, and students then came together where they, in, in small groups, you know, just what, what Carnegie Math Pathways also made very possible is the fact that we can have a class of 600 students and have two or three or five students work together in an online environment. So facilitating that small group discussions. But they would then come together and they would work on the materials uh, that we've developed in, in well, the, the collaboration with, with Pathways, with West Ed, the contextualized versions. But I think this is very much linked to, to the Pathways approach. The type of discussions that students would have would typically be in a typical les lesson, we provide them with with a context. So we always start with context. It's context driven learning, um, which which is, uh, you know, maybe the other way around, if you would, from from traditional mathematical al algebra approach. So we start with a context and then we start asking students some questions around that. We ask them to give us the expression. We ask them to give us, can, can they formulate their thinking into a formula and, and then, uh, uh, you know, derive other contexts and other applications to that. So that is typical for, for each and, and every collaboration. Thank you. And... Um... Tony would uh, like to know if you would recommend other South African institutions to use the Carnegie Maths pathway and what would your reservations be? Shall I take a, a stab on it? Um, I know you want to, Francois. Um, so colleagues, we, we wouldn't have uh, worked for five years uh, to get this if we didn't think it had something unique to offer the South African uh, context. Uh, what we were blown away by um, is something we didn't deeply fag in this presentation was, um, you know, how the phenomenal investment that was made because uh, Carnegie went and confronted uh, and uh, looked very critically at, uh, if you want to, in old terms, the didactic triangle and looked at each one of those using evidence. So they went and looked at curriculum and curriculum has been deeply confronted, right? So if you see decoloniality as uh, confronting existing thinking about how a discipline is acquired, this was done, right? Because remember now, where this started in the US is the US was concerned about the maths performance of the country as a whole, but especially students from underserved populations. Uh, and those are the majority of students in community colleges, right? So huge similarities in terms of the challenges and the, uh, in terms of schooling background, some of the diversity challenges we have ourselves, right? So that's the first reason. So they went and they said, can we do maths differently? I'm not gonna use the word better or worse. Can we do it differently, right? Secondly, with the pathways, and that's why we showed you the picture of our facilitators, comes a massive amount of staff development. So what we didn't flag and what we'll flag to you in the workshop is there's weekly meetings with our wasted colleague, colleagues, Andre that was with us at Siapu Malela um, uh, in, yes, what was it, 2018, Jenny, um, the, 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 the Pathways presentation, right? So there's a focus on developing the staff. So there's another group that's uh, capacitated to think differently about pedagogy, right? And then the students, it's all about the students. The reason there's so much data about growth mindset, stereotype threat, all those things is because this is focused 
on understanding the students that you have in front of you, not the ones you wish you had, the ones in front of you, right? If you look at growth mindset, the fact that many students believe there's such a thing as a math person. If you look at neuroscience, that's where the growth mindset works comes from. Neuroscience says there is no such thing as a math person. And that's the powerful lesson. That's part of this material. Stereotype threat. A lot of people in this country were taught over decades and decades that maths is for certain people. It's easier for certain people. It's easier for people of a certain gender. So actively confronting the psychology around mathematics is what the stereotype threat is about. And then the anxiety. So Marilla, um, Tony, I think it has a lot to offer. Um, uh, uh, the fact that it's online, you can now quadruple um, the gains in terms of digital skills, learning to function in the digital world. Uh, um, I have not seen another model where you break down a class of 700, what would have been a large class learning experience to a three, four person learning experience. Uh, what we didn't share is uh, Honori and Cordelia tried to change the groups after how many months, Honori? Did we try to change the group membership? After four weeks. After four weeks. And we um, had almost a protest situation on our hands. So quickly, the students bonded with each other. Right? How powerful can that be? Think of any discipline. And I'm not talking here about selling pathways. I'm talking about the pedagogical info, uh, innovation. If working in groups can be that powerful for mathematics, how powerful can it be in other disciplines? Sorry, Tony, you made the mistake of asking the question and I made the mistake of answering. Sorry, it's long. No, hey. I, think, <laughs> I think it's great. Um, I'm going to suggest that there are some questions in the chat that you might want to have a look at and answer because I think we need to close the session and I want to thank all the presentations here because uh, our people need to get ready for the next session in 10 minutes time and I'm sure we all need a little bit of a break. So let's give everybody a, 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 a smiley or a or a clap or a thank you, whatever. And this has been uh, interesting from thinking about how we change institutions to take uh, cognizance of uh, quality to something that is showing to have quality. Thank you very much, everyone, and to the presentations given this afternoon.